I can make the, if I make everybody's presenter, that would be. And do we know how to do it again? It's okay. It's okay. Can you tell me what's the purpose of the experiment today? What's the purpose of experiment? You could use the chat. We don't have much of an option. Use the chat. Because I have to say by computer to give you presenter mode. What's the purpose of the experiment? Uh, melting point, boiling point, and solubility of different substances. Very good, Sarah. And what's the application for it? So we are trying to measure the physical property that is the melting point, boiling point, uh, solubility of some organic compounds. Uh, can you give me application for it? What is application? At least for melting point, what is the application? Why would you measure the melting point for organic compound? To identify the compound, that's one purpose. And a second purpose would be purity, very good, to find out if your compound is pure or not. Let's say your compound it's, uh, I think we are using benzoic acid today. Uh, benzoic acid is your known sample. If it melts at 123, if I take this compound and it's a benzoic acid and I measure the melting point, if it's not 123 or 122, uh, it doesn't start between 121 and it stops at before 124, then it's going to be impure sample, especially if it, if it melts lower temperature. That means your sample is not pure. So you measure the melting point compared to literature value. And if it's lower, much lower, then it means your sample is not pure or that's not the sample. So identity, it doesn't match or the purity does not uh, match with your, with your sample. Same thing for the solubility. You measure the solubility to uh, identify your compound, to identify the functional group. For example, if we know carboxylic acid, which is a group of organic molecules, if it uh, does, because it's acidic or because of the acidic nature of carboxylic acid, if it's a small molecule, that means number of carbon is less than four. So if you have formic acid, acidic acid, propionic acid, or any acid with less than four carbon is going to dissolve in water. But if you have a carboxylic acid with six, seven, eight carbon, if it doesn't dissolve in, uh, in water, then we can try sodium hydroxide. So if your compound dissolves in sodium hydroxide, most likely has acidic nature. Um, so it's either carboxylic acid or phenol. Now, carboxylic acid is strong enough to dissolve in sodium bicarbonate. So if your compound dissolves in sodium hydroxide, it dissolves in sodium bicarbonate, definitely is a carboxylic acid. So we can narrow down our choices, what type of chemical we are dealing with, what type of functional group your compound has based on the solubility. Because like dissolves in like. If the compound does not dissolve in water, it's by nature is nonpolar. Either is nonpolar based on functional group, like alkane with no other functional group other than carbon hydrogen, or your compound is a uh, polar compound, but it has too many carbons which acting like nonpolar compound. So it doesn't dissolve in water or um, to uh, first, we, I'm going to just concentrate on measuring melting point. How would you measure the melting point? The apparatus you are using to measure melting point is called a uh, melt pump. On the surface here, it has a switch to turn on and off. It has a power regulator that you can control the power, how fast you are heating up the oven by adjusting this power regulator. It can go from zero to uh, to ten. We do have a chart. Can I, can you please get one of the charts from the labs that is on top of it? 
we do have charts in the lab that uh, it shows if the melting point for a sample, let's say, is between 100 and 150, you would have to set this up between 4 and 5. If the sample melts at 200 degree, then you have to melt it, uh, you have to adjust this between like 8 and 9 or 7 and 8 and 9. So basically, thank you, basically this chart here is going to tell us what should be the setting on the machine based on the melting point for the, for the sample. How long does it take for your sample to melt if you set the, the power regulator uh, based on the, the melting point, based on the sample of melting point. And you do not want to heat up your sample too fast or too high, high rate of melting. Uh, so you don't want to set it too high if the sample is melting at low temperature. And why is that and why do we have this chart? Because it's important rate of melting to be adjusted with respect to your compound. If you melt too fast, down here where you have your heating, the oven that is being heated, is going to heat up quickly. Your sample is in the oven, is in the sample holder which is touching the oven, is going to be heated up very fast. But your thermometer, it needs time to expand and show the actual temperature. So basically, thermometer is going to be lagging the temperature of the the temperature of the uh, meltdown apparatus or temperature of the sample if you heat up too fast. So for that reason, we have to look at the chart and know the approximate melting point for our compound, and then adjust this between 0 to 10 to proper number. Now, if you are dealing with the unknown sample, what would you do? You would do a quick melt. What is quick melt? You take a sample, and with your sample, you are going to, um, to melt it and find the approximate melting point for your sample. Then you go back and you adjust your, uh, you go back and you adjust the, the level of the heating. In order to prepare the sample, my sample, I don't know how well you could see this here, but the sample size are too big. So I even have these pieces here, if you can see it. Um, it's not going to fit into a capillar tube that I'm using to feed my sample. So my sample must be um, powdered, finely powdered. So I'm going to take the sample and place in the, uh, the mortal and pestle and grind it, grind it well. And when I'm grinding this, I'm going to decrease the size for two reasons. One, it has to fit through that small capillary tube. And second, the, it's going to avoid a space between the sample. So what I do after I grind it, since I'm the only one using this, I'm going to just use the, the, the container. I dip, I take the capillar tube. You don't touch the top of the capillar tube with the open end. Capillar tube has two ends, a closed end and an open end. You hold from the closed end. You don't touch the open end because open end goes into the, into the sample. So with the holding on the closed end, you Deep the sample, the capillary tube into sample a few times. You get the sample into the capillary tube. Now, we you can't put it with the open end down, so we have to put the sample in with the closed end. We have to somehow bring the sample down to the bottom of the capillary tube. So we use the glass tube here. We pass the capillary tube through the glass tube. I place it on the ground. I uh, don't know if you can see this or not. You see the table? Okay. The, um, you pass this through. It bounces a few times. Um, can I get a box of chem wipe, please? 
um, it's best to wipe the outside of the capillar too. Then you drop it down. I don't want too much powder to be stuck inside the glass tube. That's why I suggest to wipe it outside of the capillary tube. So you drop it a couple of times. And when you drop it a couple of times, you are going to bring, thank you, you are going to bring the sample all the way down. There should be no air gap in the uh, sample. And if your sample size, if the sample is coarse, the sample size is huge or large, then you cannot avoid that you will have air bubbles or air trap in the sample within the sample what is the problem with the air bubble within the sample if you have air bubble within the sample your sample is not going to be heated evenly because air is not good conductor of the heat air is a good insulator that's why they have like the the impact windows they have gas or air between the two layers because it's good insulator so if we have space here it acts as insulator it doesn't allow the heat to be distributed evenly and there would be a problem the bottom portion of the sample is going to heat up fast and then the top portion it takes longer time while you turn and, and since you have turned on the oven the temperature is going to increase. So the first part of the sample, when it's melted, you will see melted sample, you record the temperature, and then you have to wait for the second part of the sample to melt. And that is going to show high temperature. So even though your sample is pure, the range of the melting is going to be wide range of melting. And what does that indicate? That if you have a wide range of melting, what is problem with that? Wide range of melting, it indicates that your sample is not pure. A narrow range of melting or sharp melting, it means the sample is pure. But if it's not, if it's not melting sharply, that means your sample is not, uh, is not pure. So the size of the sample, how much should be the size of sample between two to three millimeters? You don't want to fill up the capillary tube halfway. Why not? Because there is a eyepiece in the um, meltdown apparatus that you can. There is a small window you can see the sample. If the sample is high, then it would be out of range of your view. You are not going to be able to see it. So you place that next to a thermometer holder. There is a small um, triangle. Uh, rectangular um, opening, you place your sample in there, you turn on the machine, and through the magnifying glass or eyepiece, you would look for your sample to be melted. Your thermometer is going to increase, the temperature on the thermometer is going to increase. You have to monitor this uh, because you don't want your sample to be melted and you miss that initial melting. What is initial melting? The initial melting is a temperature where some of the sample has melted. Basically, you see like a droplets of liquid on top of the sample, and that's important because you are going to, you have to have small size of the sample so you could see through this window. So you look at the, the sample, with the sample, with the magnifying glass and as soon as you see the droplets of the liquid you record the temperature it's going to take time because it was room temperature and i'm not heating too fast so while this one is melting i'm going to talk about is a known sample so i'm going to talk until this goes to 100 normally i should monitor but i know this is a known sample when the temperature reaches 100 then i will constantly look through the uh, thermometer or the meltdown, it should be low temperature or at least 10 degrees lower than the melting point of your sample before you put your sample in. If the thermometer showing, let's say, 120, I place my sample, it's going to melt right away. I don't know my sample was melting at 50 degrees, 60 degrees, or 120 degrees. But since it's going to be 
um, is going is is hot, it would melt right away. So, if it's unknown, how would you know how low should be the temp temperature on the thermometer before you put your sample? If it's unknown, you have to uh, you have to do the quick melt, quick sample melt again, as I told you earlier. To determine the rate of heating, you could do quick sample. If you want to find <clears throat> approximate melting, you could do quick sample. And then that would give you an idea how high should be the, the temperature before you put your capillary tube in. Um, now, <clears throat> if you have two samples, you don't want to use two separate thermometers. You want to use the same thermometer because known and unknown should be measured with the same thermometer. If you have um, a known and unknown or even same, two trials of the same sample, you would use the same. So how would you lower the temperature? All you have to do is turn it off and wait. Do not take the thermometer out. This thermometer is different from the thermometer that they used to, to, you know, as a child, they used to measure the melting point that you see sometimes nurses, they shake it to lower the ink. That's different. You should never take the thermometer out unless you feel like your thermometer is broken. Someone left the machine on, it explodes, and the temperature is not going up even if you've been waiting for a while. Um, otherwise, the thermometer should not be removed because if you remove it, it might sound funny, the temperature is going to drop right away, but it's not measuring temperature of the meltdown, it's measuring the temperature of the room, and the room is much cooler than the oven that is heated in here, so it will show. So what you do, you just turn it off and wait until the temperature drops down by 10 degrees less than the melting point of your your sample. We record two temperatures. One is the temperature, initial temperature, which is the temperature of the sample as it starts melting. And the other one is the temperature of the sample when the entire sample has melted and you have only liquid in the in the melt the, in the capillary tube. And normally I don't hold this up, I leave it down. I, the only reason I'm holding up because I want to be, you know, for you to see it easier and also I can talk and explain the other techniques or points of the lab techniques for measuring the melting point. Now, let's say you were talking to your friend, someone came and asked you a question and you missed the melting point. You look and see is you miss initial melting is already melted. What do you need to do? Can anyone answer that question if you can hear me? And uh, that's also check that you do hear me. What would you do if you forget, you fail to forget the melting point? Can you take the capillary tube, leave it out to make your sample solid and put it back again? No. Very good. Why not? The organic compounds, they have low melting point generally. And because of the low melting, the, uh, the, the compound can actually decompose at high temperature. So if the sample is melted and past the melting point, it's probably already uh, decomposed. Or when you lower the temperature to get to the okay melting point starts at 120 record the number this is the number you need to record in your data sheet okay right now it stop melting um, it's finished melting 123 123 and 120. Those are the numbers that you are going to put for your known sample. The sample is melted. If I wait, now it's going to solidify. 
you see that it's now solid. I cannot use this for my second trial. I have to use a new capillary tube, new sample, because two things could happen. The sample could have decomposed, or this sample, when it goes from liquid to solid, it, for, it can form different crystalline form. So if the crystallization form of the sample changes, we are not going to get um, the same melting point. The nature of the compound is going to change. A good example of that is graphite and diamond. Both of them are made of carbon, but the crystalline form it's, is, a, is completely different, and the physical property is completely different. One would melt, but uh, it takes more than 1,500 degrees Celsius to melt, and the other one uh, lower melting point. So the crystalline form is important. So I turned off the oven. Uh, the the melting apparatus it has to wait for it to I have to wait until it's cooled down um, to lower than the temperature for melting point for my next compound before I can use it. So meanwhile, I want you to tell me what is the next compound that we should measure the melting point for. So we have to go for the melting point. The general procedure didn't have to be. I didn't talk about it, but the specific procedure. Uh, but if you did write down it, it's not, uh, you didn't lose much. So a specific procedure that was the, the one that we are using. So which one, which other compound? Melting point. What's your next compound? I cannot see it. Urea? Okay, very good. The temperature is Celsius. Very good. Sorry if I didn't give you the. So the next sample is going to be urea. For urea, I am going to uh, use a different. Can you find the melting point for urea for me, please? Urea, okay, one third. Okay, urea melts at one. Um, 34, so where is urea? I found everything but urea. Okay, it's right here. Urea, for urea also I have to do the same thing. I have to grind the sample because this course, it's like a granular, like sand, like crystalline. Um, shape like little, little balls, that's how I can describe it. It doesn't fit into capillary tubes, so I'm going to do, I have to crush it, right. I can't use that spatula, and I'm not using it anymore because I dropped it, but I grind this uh, and I don't need it anymore because I already got my sample. I grind my sample, prepare my sample for urea. Take a capillary tube. I'm just showing this so it's going to be more visual practice for you, please. It's going to be at the open end. I dip it into the into the sample. Do I have an unknown here? Okay. I wipe outside of the capillary tube because I don't want the I don't want the glass tube to be fill, uh, filthy or filled up with the powder. If you hold it up straight, it would actually bounce better. And the sample, it condenses at the bottom of the tube. And this condensing the sample at the bottom of the tube is going to help 
with avoiding any air bubbles. And if you don't have air bubbles, it's going to be um, even distribution of the of the heat. Okay, replace the. By, by the time I prepared the sample, this actually came down to 105, so it's a good timing for me to place the sample. And I'm going to turn on the melter, turn it on, put the temperature between 4 and 5, because based on the chart that I have, if the sample melts at 150, a, um, between 100 and 150, a good setting for this is going to be between 4 and 5. And let me show you how I read this chart. Okay, so if you see the chart, it's showing the melting point. And this line of the plateau is showing the setting for the, uh, for the meltdown. So if it's between 100 and 150, the numbers that I could use is either 4 or 5. So I can put between like 4 and 5. If the sample melting between 250 and 350, the number that I should use it should be 7. Okay. I have to be careful now, starting from 100, and um, I don't want to miss the melting point again, so I keep monitoring this. Can you bring me a hot plate, please? Yes. Are we doing boiling? Yes, we have boiling. And um, I try not to get you on the camera because it ca it's going to be released later. Yeah, I know. I'm trying to not. Yeah, that's why. <laughs> that's why I don't ask for help here. Otherwise, I would have appreciated it. Yeah. Very good. Can I not be on the camera at all? Uh, because of the privacy, unless you, you don't have problems. Okay. You need help. You need help. You're one person doing a whole experiment. You know, that's what I'm here to do. I'm here to help you. Thank you. Okay. We just wait until it's going to um, to melt. Initial melting again would be the droplets on top of the sample. And then the final melting is going to be when entire sample is is melted. And what's my next compound? Now we should look for unknown, right? I take a sample of unknown. While I'm waiting for urea to melt, and periodically and often, I check my sample to make sure that I don't miss the melting. I'm just working ahead. I have the sample for the unknown.
Okay. The table that you should have for your solubility chart, basically you have to expand the table that it's in the is in your um, lab manual. So this is a sample table. Make sure you have a similar table to this to record your data for solubility. Because if you just put the sample that is in the lab manual, the lab manual does not continue with every solvent that we have and every uh, sample that we are using. We are using three solutes, that is sodium chloride, benzoic acid, and urea. And we have Okay, your sample, it's started 130. It shows a little low temperature, but it's okay. It's 130, and it went to 134. 130 to 134, that's the sample melting for urea. That's the temperature degree Celsius. I turn it off and I wait until temperature is lower. What temperature should I go down? This is for all. Any idea how low should be the temperature? The temperature on the melting apparatus, it should be lower than the, temp the melting point of my unknown. How low should I go? No response? What do you think? Can you hear me? Yes, I, it looks like you're hearing me. Your unknown could be what? It could be either uh, urea or it could be benzoic acid because we, we are comparing known to unknown. So if you have the melting point for yeah, you have the melting point for, for the uh, benzoic acid, we know that the melting point for benzoic acid was lower than the urea. So this should be even lower than melting point for, okay, 100 makes sense. Okay, 100 makes sense, but it cannot be higher than 110. Because if my sample is pure, it's going to melt uh, at a number higher than 120. If it's urea, it would be closer to 130 or between 134 uh, and 136. If it's benzoic acid, it would be 121 to 123. But uh, it's going to be higher than 120. So as long as my temperature is 110 or lower, I should be fine. So we just wait for that. Um, so while we're waiting for thermometer to go down, we use the time to show you this again, the chart. This is the chart that you should have for your solubility. Uh, we have toluene. I want to make sure with the new I want to make sure that I have the same hexane, toluene, ethanol, ethyl acetate, and water. Hexane, ethyl acetate, ethanol, and water. Perfect. Okay, so the table is fine that you have on page nine, and I don't know for ebook still is page nine. Uh, you just have to expand that. It's not just NACL. We are also 
trying the benzoic acid and urea. You have another sample that is naphthalene. I just don't like to use the naphthalene for this experiment uh, because of the, the smell, strong odor of it. Uh, I'm not in the fume hood. I'm not working in the fume hood, so I'm going to uh, because of the setup. But the different solubility for this sample is going to give you an idea if uh, polar compound dissolves in uh, polar solvent and non-polar dissolves in non-polar. Okay, the meltem has reached to 109. I'm going to start the melting of the unknown. And wait. I need I need more test tubes because it's five and three fifteen test tubes. So. Oh, we have. Do you see the sample holder? Do you see the sample in there by any chance? You see the thermometer? To see the sample better, if I move the capillary tube up and down, you could see that is moving, moving object. If we change the position to the second slot, maybe you can see. Okay. Any luck? Can you see it? I just want you to see the, the eyepiece, the magnifying glass. Okay, very good. So you see the sample next to the thermometer, in the thermometer uh, sample holder, and that's what we are looking to see when it starts. Uh, melting it starts sweating the side i want to show you when it's uh, sweated so you can record we can record the initial melting and when it is uh, completely melted uh, for the final melting i don't know it's going to be hard to see the sweating because it's such a tiny tube but if you see it, at least it gives you better experience of the melting point. First, I have to catch it myself before I can show it to you. Okay, try it. Please try it. Try your best to see if you can see the sample, like sweating sample. And that is the temperature is 119. I don't know the resolution. 
but I could see the capillary from my camera. Okay, the sample is completely melted. That is a 124, maybe it was 123, but by the time I saw it, it was 124. So uh, 119 to 124. Okay, the melted sample, you see the clear liquid, of course, is uh, when you, it's a clear liquid and when you take it out, you lower the temperature, it's going to freeze again. Okay, you want to make sure to turn off your, your meltdown and these capillary tubes, they don't go to garbage can, they go to the broken glass box that they are considered like sharp, so we don't want to um, drop in the garbage can. Um, solubility, if you have your chart perfect, this chart, if you don't have it, draw it now. Um, we are going to mix each one of these samples like NaCl with hexane, toluene, ethanol, ethyl acetate, and water. And then, then we move to benzoic acid. Uh, before even mixing, you should have an idea if it dissolves or it doesn't dissolve based on your prior knowledge. And if not, we will experience it now. Uh, I guess someone was trying to... So to avoid any contamination, I pour some of the solvent into the into a small beaker, and then I use the dropper from the beaker, uh, the dropper to get the solvent from the beaker into a small test tube. If we have solid and liquid solubility, it's recognized by looking at the appear, disappearance of the, of the solid. Now, if your sample does not dissolve at all, it's going to settle or float in the test tube and the liquid portion is going to be clear, completely clear, uh, but with the solid visible in there. If your sample is soluble, it's going to disappear, dissolves completely in the, in the solvent, and no left, clear. So that is completely soluble. If your sample, um, some of it dissolves, and your solution, the solution portion, portion or the liquid portion is cloudy, that means it's partially soluble. Partially soluble or slightly soluble, those are some of the terms that is like not complete uh, solubility. Now, how would you distinguish between the partial soluble like moderately soluble, slightly soluble, those are terms that like the, the, you know, the small and smaller and uh, the quantity that is going to, uh, to dissolve. The only uh, difference is that if it's not completely soluble, if with the liquid is going to be clear, not cloudy, if it's partially soluble, um, is going to be um, cloud. Okay, how would you test for solubility? You put your sample. I'm going to test with the sodium chloride first. So the portion or the ratio of your sample to your solvent, it must be proper. You would use like a very small amount, like 0.1 gram, about 0.1 gram, so I'm just using tip of a spatula. Very small amount of the solvent with um, two to five milliliters of the solvent. If I use too little of the solvent, 
even NaCl is not going to dissolve in water because it can saturate the solution. If the solution is saturated, some of it dissolves and the rest would stay. So you want to make sure that you don't saturate your solution. So you use proper ratio of the solvent to solute. So the solvent we are using based on the procedure. How much of solvent? We follow the procedure for this. If you can tell me, is it two milliliter or the five milliliter we are using? Okay, two milliliter for each solvent, uh, each of the solvent, and tip of a spatula, very small amount of the uh, of the salt. Done with the melting point. For these, it's going to be. I'm going to have five test tubes because I have five solvents, and I'm going to follow the table that I have for my solvent. So the first solvent is going to be hexane, second toluene, third ethanol, ethyl acetate, and then and then water. But First, I'm just putting the, the small amount of salt. Now, you should always close the containers for organic molecules, even though NACL is not organic, but it's a good habit. To avoid contamination, you have to close the containers because if you don't close this container, you have the lid on the floor, on the table, and you open this, you put it next to it, later on you don't know which one is which. They are very similar. You cannot have color-coded jars for every single uh, organic compound that we have in the lab. And we, we, uh, we get from the same... Uh, Manufacture same brand, so they are all very similar. So we have to make sure to close the containers right away. So I'm going to add hexane to the first sample. This is the sample of hexane and sodium chloride. The sample, and I agitate, mix it well. Then I observe it. I want you to observe it and record what is the situation. Is it soluble, insoluble, or partially soluble? Yes, I only mentioned the NaCl, urea, and benzoic acid. The THF. It's not on the new lab manual. If you are using old lab manual, that's a different story. The new lab manual does not have the, the third edition or the fourth edition. That's the one that you should be using. It doesn't have the THF. THF is stopped after the second. OK, did you record it? Soluble, insoluble, or partially soluble? Hexane and NaCl. Just give me a yes if you record it because I'm moving to the next one. This is a live session and you, I want you to be... Blurry it's blurry. Okay, maybe I'm moving my hand. Okay, I'm going to hold my hand with the other hand. Now, the, the liquid portion is clear or is cloudy? Well, my camera is showing clear. Do you see the solid or you don't see the solid at the bottom? Do you see white or clear? Clear, no solid. But actually, maybe the angle is not good. Maybe you could put it on a black background. We'll background? See it more. It's like a black background. Put it up against. You see the, 
the white powder underneath, under the, uh, at the bottom of the test tube, or no? Yes. Okay, so if you see the white powder, that means that the uh, sample did not dissolve and the liquid is clear. If the liquid is clear and the sample did not dissolve, what it means is that this sample is not soluble. I want to make sure that you distinguish between soluble and insoluble. If it's not soluble, the liquid stays clear, but you still have the solid in there. Because if you have the solid, that means the solid just settled down. It didn't bother. It didn't dissolve. So if you see the white powder, that means you have insoluble sample. The second solvent was toluene. And with the toluene, the nature of toluene and hexane, they are very similar. Uh, toluene is aromatic. Hexane is not aromatic. Mix it, agitate it, uh, and uh, clot. See, maybe it's better. So I'm going to hold it against a black background, as was suggested here. So you can record your observation. Insoluble. That IS stands for insoluble. I stands for insoluble, right? I for insoluble. OK. Because you see the white powder, right? And it does make sense. Toluene is uh, organic and um, Salt is inorganic sample. After the toluene, you have the ethanol. OK, again, clear liquid. And solid is still present, right? Very good. Thank you. I hope everybody is able to follow, able to see the, the difference, because this is the maximum that I said I could, I could do for you to get the experience. That this is the ethanol. Ethanol. Yes. I'm going with the same order that you have in the table in page 9 of the lab manual. And next one is going to be ethyl acetate. Okay, ethyl acetate. Very good. With the ethyl acetate, it's going to be similar. And last one is water. What do you expect from water? You expect to dissolve. OK, what do you see? Soluble? OK, you see there is no white powder at the bottom, and the liquid is clear. Next. I'm going to do the same with uh, was this my other? No. With the benzoic acid comes next. I 
should have labeled on what my mistake. I'm gonna have to use from this. Okay. I'm going to place benzoic acid. Half a cup of water, half a beaker of water, place in a hot plate for me to heat up. And is it two fifty? Yes. Okay, I, I have the benzoic acid in the in the second set. I'm adding the solvents. Want me to turn it on? Yes, please. Hexane, first one. Let me add and then I show you on that. Ethyl acetate. I have from the second set is the hexane with benzoic acid and uh, we're trying to see if it's going to dissolve or not okay What do you see? Insoluble at room temperature because it's the, uh, you see the white powder still? That's okay. And next one is toluene with uh, benzoic acid. Benzoic acid is a polar sample. Hexane and toluene, they are both nonpolar. So, It kind of makes sense for it not to dissolve. Toluene and benzoic acid. Toluene is aromatic. Benzoic as benzoic acid also is is aromatic. So it did dissolve actually. Okay. You see all clear liquid? So it all clear liquid is soluble. I'm looking at the at the um, my screen to see what you see on the camera. So I'm not looking at the camera, so it kind of looks weird. I'm talking to you, I'm looking the other way, but the other way is the camera that I want to see if you can what you see actually. Next one is the Sample of ethanol with benzoic acid.
You see that? Soluble, okay? Ethyl acetate with benzoic acid. Ethyl acetate with benzoic, benzoic acid, also soluble. Okay. And uh, benzoic acid with, with water. You don't see the solid at the bottom, but the solid moved up and is floating at top. So for cold water, this sample is not soluble. I'm going to leave this sample only because I'm not testing everything in hot water, but I'm holding, I'm going to place this one in hot water to show you that some uh, organic compounds, they are uh, not soluble at low temperature, but soluble at high temperature. That is the rule for every solubility, uh, because so when you talk about solubility, 99% uh, of the time, 95 or higher than 95% of the time, you increase the solubility, uh, you increase the temperature, the solubility is increasing. So one of the application for, for this solubility at high temperature is used for your experiment three is recrystallization and you are using benzoic acid. You heat it up um, at high temperature, you dissolve, you cool down the temperature, you get the crystals back. So because of that, I want you to see today that even though it did not dissolve in cold water, it does dissolve in hot water. So I leave it in the hot water. And since the water is being heated, it's not hot yet, I just leave it there for it to um, get hot, dissolve, and I can continue with the second, uh, with the last set of the, the solubility. Can we get one more of this piece? Because I'm afraid if I don't crush it, it may not dissolve. It works without. <laughs> we have everything needed. Okay, here is a sample of uh, urea with water. Urea is a highly polar organic molecule. It was one of the first organic compounds that ever was synthesized out of the. Uh, other than just extracting from living. So it is highly polar and it did dissolve in water. Urea in water is done. So we're going to look for urea in I start, it looks like, from this way, so let me continue from this way. Ethyl acetate. Uh, 
Okay. Ethyl acetate with urea. Do you see it or you want me to explain what's going on? Insoluble? Okay. You have the particles down and the clear liquid on top, so insoluble. Next one is ethanol. With the ethyl acetate, the solution is not like 100% clear, so I think partially soluble is a better choice for that. Because as I was leaving, see that some of the sample disappeared and the solution is slightly cloudy, so you could say slightly soluble or partially soluble. Ethanol. Yes, urea and ethyl acetate was partially soluble. Urea and ethanol about like half of it dissolved. So also partially soluble. Partially soluble in ethanol. So since I have the grains now, I'm actually going a little bit more aggressive and I'm going to count the grains to see how many of them would disappear. Eight of them with toluene. Okay, urea with toluene. With toluene, also, you see this grains, I don't know if it's visible or not, it did not dissolve, so insoluble. Urea with hexane. Okay. 
Okay, no change at all, so not soluble. Okay. Benzoic acid has not dissolved yet because the water is not hot yet. It's warm, but it's not hot yet. So we're going to wait until the water is boiling, and then we could see if it's going to dissolve or, or not. Do you have any questions for me? Any questions? Any concerns? No? We are not going to measure the boiling point for the sample, but I'm going to show you the assembly for the sample, how to assemble it. You can. This is the benzoic acid in hot water, which has dissolved. So I wanted you to see that the benzoic acid dissolves in hot water, but it doesn't dissolve in cold water. Solubility increases as you increase the temperature. Set up for boiling point, you take a thermometer, you would use a uh, seal tube. This is like a tiny uh, glass tube. You are going to secure that using a rubber band to the thermometer. And we want to make sure that it's going to be at the same level as the thermometer ball. You place your sample in. I'm going to use the ethanol as my sample. Add five drops to it. And you know what, I'm going to actually take it back. I'm going to measure, because I have everything ready for you to measure the boiling point. I'm going to measure the boiling point as well. So you take a capillar tube, hold it from close end, place it in the uh, seal tube inside the liquid with the open end down. Then 
you are going to secure this using a thermometer clamp to stand and let it heat up as the sample is heating up when the temperature of the thermometer reaches boiling point of the sample your sample starts boiling how are you going to see that the sample inside this tiny capillar tube also is going to start boiling and when it does boil it's going to change to gas and since this gas and this glass tube is capillary tube is closed and it's not going to be able to go from the top so it's going to the gas or the bubbles will start coming out from the bottom of the capillary tube and then you will see bubbles coming out because it's exiting into a liquid you will actually see those bubbles when those bubbles come out that means you are very close to the boil uh, to the to the boiling point of the sample you turn down the heat, you turn off the heat, you let it cool down, and those bubbles stop coming out. As soon as bubbles stop coming out, you record the temperature as the boiling point of the temperature. Well, this is much easier if you were using Bunsen burner. With a hot plate, the surface of the plate is still very hot, so it's going to make it hard for it to, to stop bubbling. So uh, we are going to record the temperature when the bubbles start coming out as the boiling point for, for ethanol. Uh, I want you to tell me if you can see, it's a little far from here, or I need to move the setup closer for you to see it. Um, I don't need these. Can you just move it to the cart or something that yes. you can take it later? Maybe I can bring the... Are you done with them to the phone? Yeah, you're done. Thank you. So I can bring the hot plates. Are needed for Charlie. Yeah. But use them for next lab. I know. Um, Is it Friday? Going to, pardon? I think it's going to be Friday. I think uh, because these are what are found in the drawers, I think we'll be leaving them out. But putting them on the side. At least it's what I am going to do right now. Since I already know what is the boiling point for ethanol, uh, the water that I have here cannot be higher than the boiling point of the ethanol. That's why I'm adding cold water to adjust the temperature to lower than the boiling point. So as soon as I place it, it doesn't start bubbling because then I don't know what is the, is the boiling point of the sample or is much higher than the boiling point of the sample. So I lower the temperature. I'm going to drop the sample down into the, the 
water to make sure that the whole sample is immersed in the water and wait for it for the bubbles to form. The, uh, when the bubbles form, then I can record the number as the boiling point. And I'm going to see if I can just bring the camera closer to here for you to see the bubbles. I just turned it on. Can you see the setup for the boiling point? Okay, so when the bubbles start coming out, I'm going to tell you so you can probably pay little attention to it. So do you see the little bubbles coming out? So I just saw one bubble, little bubble coming out. I'm going to keep this straight without moving so it doesn't get blurry. So tell me when you see the bubbles so I could show you the temperature. It's getting very close because I saw one bubble coming up. Okay. Do you see the bubbles now? Tiny bubbles coming to the side of the capillar too. Do you see them? Yes. They are tiny. If you can't see it, it's... Okay. You see those bubbles? I'm moving around so you could see it. You see the bubbles? You see now one coming out? Like that. Those are the bubbles that are coming out of the capillary tube. Okay? So we see those bubbles coming out of the capillary tube. That is the boiling point for your sample. And then you come here, look at the temperature, thermometer, and you read the thermometer. It's 78, okay, 78 for the boiling point for the, for the ethanol. I'm going to hold it down. We already record the temperature. This is going to bubble until it dries up. I want anybody who didn't see the bubbles before, you could see it now, how they are coming out. See the bubbles? You see those bubbles coming out? Very good. Perfect. Okay. That's boiling point for ethanol. Now, we are done with the experiment for the melting point, boiling point and the solubility for boiling point I only use the ethanol so you can write your report based on just the ethanol and uh, you had one unknown for the melting point do you have any questions for me
Yes, 78. What, uh, any questions for me? Yes, only cold water and please include the hot water for benzoic acid only. Uh, the benzoic acid was soluble in hot water. So you can include that one only. Any other questions? Okay, if you don't have any questions, we are done with the uh, experiment. Now you have to worry about the report. And to write the report, um, it's due, I made it due Sunday night. And if you check the assignment box, which I'm going to actually check it with you to make sure that is uh, unknown sample and urea for part one. I don't understand which what uh, what this for melting point. Yes, we did the unknown sample and uh, and the urea and benzoic acid. And the report is due Sunday night. The pictures of the lab the notebook, not on the report, because you are already turning it into the, the folder that it says lab notebook. So you don't have to put the pictures as part of the report. You're welcome. Okay, if you see, uh oh, I said share and then I click stop share. Data, uh, include the data, only the data part, please. Yes, only the data. Include the data in report. I gave you the, the values as we were doing the experiment. Uh, don't remember, do you remember? Anybody remember? It can help. So, for this one, if you see the screen for the experiment now, we have For experiments, for experiment one, the experiment one lab notebook, the three lab experiment, melting point video. I'm sure you watch these videos, which is good. And then upload the lab report for physical property here. We are going to upload it there. Not for the unknown, just for the, the known sample that is the ethanol. Very good. Okay. Any other questions? I'm going to stop the recording now and uh, I'd be here to answer your questions if you have any. Um,